pause in our headlong rush. If we can do this, we will not just avoid bad futures of the, that are uh, ahead. We can take full advantage of the technologies I mentioned, nanotech, biotech, cognotech, and infotech to get humanity to what I would call a sustainable superabundance for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and perfectly on time. So uh, I want to pick up on, um, while we're putting a polling question up, I'm gonna ask you to pick up on uh, something you talked about towards the end of your presentation. Uh, so we have a multiple choice question coming up now, which uh, everyone can take, take part in. Um, the question to you, David, uh, your screen's frozen, but hopefully you haven't, um, is around this issue of covering up. Um, you talked about the fact that governments, individuals, uh, corporations have a tendency to cover up bad news or try to represent it in a way that looks positive and to make um, what appear to be top acts of catastrophe sound like planned and evidence based decision making. Are we in a world where we can change that? Is there potential, are there evidence models out there you can say this nation does this or this corporation does this? Are there enough good examples that we can use to catalyze that shift to more transparency and more ownership of our, our mistakes? So I see two things that need to happen. We need to put in place metrics that penalize uh, politicians or companies or indeed uh, political parties that are found to be hiding bad news and distorting them, just as we now have a higher priority on companies who can point to real corporate and social responsibility or good practices in hiring minorities or uh, equal pay for women. These are metrics that have been brought in. We should prioritize metrics of uh, openness and transparency. But second, you're entirely right. We should look at examples around the world. I saw just the other day the Norwegian Prime Minister was uh, praised for having the honesty to say maybe Norway had made a mistake, maybe they should have done more like Sweden. And she was openly reflecting on that uh, possibility. It's a kind of an uh, unexpected thing to do because Norway's statistics in the COVID are better than Sweden's. But there she was honestly reflecting on maybe we have a learning here. And we need to highlight examples of countries that have uh, admitted mistakes and changed, and we should make it uh, something that people want to do rather than being ashamed of. Business succeeds when they can have smart failures and fail forwards. They don't hide from failures, but they're willing to learn from them. If we always hide having been involved in failures and don't want to admit this, we're not going to grow and we're not going to be more successful. So let's have a more successful uh, examples and I know that Jeff has looked at this quite a lot. Jeff has examples from around the world of places that are uh, perhaps not so well known but deserve to be better known and can serve as models for all of us. Excellent. Okay right well let's uh, let's now take while people are still voting let's take some of the panel um, participant questions. So we have a question from Sheila Moorcroft who's just stepped down off the panel. Um, is part of the problem really lack of social imagination, similar to the low value placed on soft skills, uh, caring, etc., rather than formal skills such as tech and educated skills. Jeff, it, have we just not placed enough em em emphasis on any of the soft aspects? Um, I'm not sure who we is. I, whenever anyone says we in any conversation, I kind of want to know who we is, but anyway, let's that's, that, that's park that. Um, I think, you know, there's been a whole series of sort of biases in uh, our societies the last few decades, which have, I mean, very well understood, a bias towards the economic over the social, a bias to hardware and technology over uh, what are sometimes called you know, soft skills, uh, EQ, collaboration, all those other things, which uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain we will need more in our education in the future. And I think all of that has, it has together let's say, squeezed out, atrophied our collective ability to imagine uh, our future society. And the simple test of that, the reason I, I got interested in this space was just asking lots of people at random in many different countries, you know, can you describe, can you picture a plausible, desirable, better way of running a society in 30, 40, 50 years time? 
And almost without exception, people can describe an apocalypse. They can describe climate disaster, AI disaster, and so on. Many can describe you know, what could happen to the fourth industrial revolution and smart cities, but incredibly few can describe a better society. And that's why things like universal basic income sort of fill that space as you know, a very, very simple, I'm not, not very convincing answer, I think, but you know, it's almost a symptom of the, the lack of imagination that people lurch onto so things like that as, as, as a sufficient answer. Perhaps I guess also just very quickly build on what David just said, because I think this, this, this is really important. We're at a kind of pivotal moment. Um, we have had many institutions in the past which were there to encourage truth, to make it harder to bury, <laughs> to bury truths. And that's the role of a free media, of audits, inspections. We have a whole you know, array of institutions which I mean you can't, to make it harder to get away with lies, but they've all been weakened uh, and dramatically weakened in the US by the start of the Trump administration, countries like Hungary, Turkey, and others. And one of the, the issues at the moment is whether corporates uh, choose to be on one side or, on, or another. Uh, Twitter's, you know, um, putting the warning alongside Trump's tweet a couple of days ago was a really interesting moment. Facebook is going the opposite direction, is de basically decided not to become a guardian, an agent of truth. Google's been always ambivalent. And I think it's, to me, it's really important that those big powers and platforms which are even more powerful than they were two months ago become part of so where the greater public interest in truth telling and making it costly to lie or bury things. And we as citizens should be putting pressure on them uh, to do the right thing. Interesting on that, that issue of power. Bruce Lloyd, when he was talking last night, he's one of the contributors to the book, he talked about whether we should swap the term power for responsibility and start talking about people who have great responsibility and what goes with that and talking about the corridors of responsibility. And, and maybe that starts to shift the behaviour of some of these tech behemoths if, if they see themselves as really having responsibility rather than just power. Um, David, do you have any thoughts on Sheila's question? I thought it's a very good one. It made me think. It is certainly true that uh, without the willingness to admit mistakes, we won't be able to learn and change. We just double down. I often say that the most important skill is uh, one of the most important skills for the future in, in whatever profession you're in is the skill of agility. That means being able to change tack quite quickly because whatever skill you'll learn at university, almost certainly it's going to be partially made uh, less important as uh, technology changes and society changes. So how can we change ourselves quickly? Agility, there are techniques, but at heart it requires an emotional resilience. A resilience that says, okay, I, I, I actually did end up bet, betting on the wrong horse here and it's not the end of the world. I can, I can cope with it. So let's indeed uh, explore how emotional intelligence can uh, assist uh, more people to embrace truth tech telling as opposed to what's sometimes called blue lies. People talk about white lies, which is when you tell, the, tell something that's not true to avoid hurting somebody's feelings. A blue lie is sometimes described as something you say is not true, but it helps your gang. It helps your tribe. It's what your tribe would like, will, will benefit from. It makes the other side's uh, life less convenient. So we need to ha have the psychological strength to move away from our willingness to tell blue lies and much more psychological willingness to honestly learn and move forwards. Carrot and stick. Excellent. Let's, um, let's share the polling results and get your, your thoughts on that. So any surprises there in the answer that we're putting far more weight on stronger global collaboration than we are on the use of greater focus on, on, uh, on the need for greater focus on resilience and preparedness. And relatively low support for the other two as well. Does that mean we've lost faith in government? I mean, is, that, is that what's showing here? Well, well I mean? think it shows that global coordination is particularly hard, and so people are possibly expressing their wishful thinking and saying, well, we need to make it better. It's the most urgent thing. All these other things can be addressed to an extent locally, whereas the global nature of the risks ahead, the biggest risks ahead, are going to require a, a reconfiguration and a strengthening of these international institutions. So I think that's perhaps why that's come out high, highest on this uh, voting. 
and, and in a way, through the crisis, all the work has been done basically at a national level by national governments. It's revealed the really weakness of the global institutions, and obviously the US pulling out of the WHO takes that even further. I think this, I, my hope is this will lead to a bounce back of uh, attending not only to how we strengthen existing global institutions, but create new ones. And in fact, next this week, I'm publishing some proposals on exactly that. It's probably the worst time in some ways to do it, um, in that there is, with you know Trump in the White House, there is zero chance of moving towards global government. But then if you think about the UN, 10 years before the UN was created, it looked completely hopeless, completely impossible to imagine a new global institution. So I think this is exactly be the time to think a bit more imaginatively about what we need if we were creating a global governance system now not in 1947 what would it look like are these brand new institutions jeff or are they are the evolutions of the un and the world bank and the imf and so on um it's a mixture of the two uh, and there's not even this now but there's a whole series of fields uh, well, on the environment and biodiversity, we've already got some new institutions on data, cybersecurity, AI, we're completely missing them, or indeed the internet. So uh, it, it's it's really a sort of thinking, what would we create if we had a, a bit more of a blank sheet, as they did in the 1940s, to create institutions fitted to the big risks and indeed opportunities of now rather than then. And, and finance is far too dominant, actually, in our existing institutions, IMF and World Bank. And there's no equivalence on data, knowledge, information, which now dominate the economy and dominate our daily lives. That's just one of the many examples of, a, of an imbalance in the global system. I think one of the learnings from the crash in 2007, 2008, 2009, was the importance of international cooperation. Uh, Gordon Brown, I, I don't think gets quite enough credit uh, for what he did in helping to pull people together and ensuring this was quickly raised to the highest level. Uh, has not been anything comparable, sadly, for the, the current round. Well, the EU are trying to pull together a fund to do something, but it's not clear how they'll use the money or whether they'll get support from all of the member nations. And there's certainly no support from the US for being part of any such club, is there? So it's very hard to get anything serious at a global level if you, unless you have the US, EU, China and India at least in alignment. They're not at the moment, but I think it's quite plausible in two or three years time on some of these issues, at least three of those four or five powers could be in alignment on creating new institutions. And can I just echo one other thing David said, which is, is a really which about wisdom and his example of the Norwegian prime minister. I become more and more convinced of, of, of what as David said, that wisdom means acknowledging when you got things wrong and showing you've learned from that. Uh, and yet many of the people in our sort of culture who purport to be the sources of wisdom never, never admit to their own errors. Indeed, the gurus of our times are often the worst people admitting all the things they got wrong. So I never listen to anyone who's not willing to admit the things they got wrong. Uh, and I think we should all as sort of, as customers, of insight be much more critical of the people claiming to be wise because often they're the worst as i said very very uh, very true um on that topic of people being wise eric mead asks uh or says futurists have talked for years about the big crisis that would happen right about now in the us we've seen the pandemic and economic slowdown compounded by race riots as the year continues, what else could go wrong that would be worth considering? So what are those other known unknowns or unknown unknowns that could be heading down the track or even known knowns um, that we're just not putting enough attention on? Do, do you want to, Either so many years ago, I had to over, overhaul the UK government's risk machinery, which actually worked quite well for a while and usually had pandemics as the, the, the top risk. Um, this sort of audience will be very familiar with the other ones on that. I think you know, there's big issues, perhaps not this year, but in the near term around food security and food supply, uh, biodiversity crashes, the sort of infrastructure crashes we have seen in some other countries. And of course, we haven't seen for the last year or two really serious cyber uh, attacks and collapse at a systematic level, but that, that must be one of the top issues for a world which is even more dependent on a functioning internet right now. Um, the risk of uh, things really crashing uh, is pretty serious, and there's another point where there's no global governance institutions there to help 
the integrity of our global communication systems. We rely on sort of bilateral arrangements and standard setting, but uh, you know they they're, they're definitely not quite fit for purpose in my view. I'll offer three examples. I think the chaos of a no-deal Brexit is uh, going to bite us terribly as that uh, evolves in the later months of this year. Uh, secondly, I think there are risks of a worse uh, extreme weather. Uh, we've had the sunniest spring in records, or is it the driest May? Probably both. Uh, we haven't had such uh, bad extremes of weather in Britain recently, but around the world, I think there is the possibility of runaway changes in climate. We are rightly worried about the mainstream predictions of what may happen with the climate, but I think we should assign more attention to the less likely but more impactful runaway scenarios, which could kick in sooner rather than later. The third scenario is the highest of the waves on that picture, which I couldn't show you which is uh, improvements in artificial intelligence. We already have had chaos in our democracy as a result of what Facebook allowed on its systems as a result of fairly simple ta personalized targeting of messages. As we have better systems, I saw recently OpenAI has come up with a new version of its text generator, GPT-3 which can uh, produce uh, quite plausible sounding text pretty easily. And it's all part of what uh, various people can now use to manipulate us more than before. And some of it's going to go wrong, just like the malware that the North Koreans unleashed on the world, uh, the WannaCry, had all kinds of uh, outcomes that the, even the North Koreans did not want and did not anticipate. I think the people who start unleashing that kind of malware on the world with uh, AI guiding some of it to manipulate individuals more uh, thoroughly than before, it could have uh, consequences that nobody is ready for. So that is high on my own list of things to uh, pay attention to. Excellent. Well, we're in, in our closing two minutes, let me give you one minute each on uh, David Heath's question. He basically suggests that fake no news is often a euphemism for information that I don't agree with. So in this world where, you know, as you talked about, AI is, is becoming more and more plausible in the content it can generate, um, how do we get closer to a truth that we can all accept? Mm. What can we do? And again, there's that issue of the we, Jeff, but, you know, how do we get closer to a truth that has more universal acceptance and is less challenged? Well, I disagree that fake news is simply things we dislike. There is lots of evidence that people very carefully construct uh, misleading narratives and uh, go in to uh, distort people. Look at the work of the IRA, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which has been well documented now, and other groups. So there is deliberate maliciousness in there. Uh, now, it's not easy to figure out what's true and what's not true. We should not imagine there is a simple question. I studied the philosophy of science for four years in my youth, and one of the big questions in the philosophy of science is how do you distinguish good science from fake science? It's actually called pseudoscience. There's a demarca question of the demarcation principle. Uh, how do you know when somebody's just uh, got the garb of scientific clothing but doesn't actually follow it? And the answer is it's hard, and you've got to work at it. That's why I spent four years studying the philosophy of science, and I think we're going to have to bring people up stage by stage, the different levels of gradually applying more critical thinking skills. There is no simple magic bullet. It is hard work, and we have to make people want and enjoy that hard work to become more expert in figuring out the limits of expertise of different people. Yes. Yeah, so I think fake news is both a supply problem and a demand problem. The supply problem is people deliberately, as David said, you know, trying to uh, misinform. And we need to constrain that supply and get the platforms on side, not so easily spreading fake news as they have done in the last 10 years. And that is a still unresolved issue, whether they are going to be allies or part of the problem. And then on the demand side, uh, people do want to have confirmatory information. You know, if you're an anti-Brexiteer, you will want lots of confirmation that Brexit's a disaster and vice versa uh, and so on. And to that, I think we do need to, kids to learn from an early age how to be willing to absorb conflicting ideas. Uh, Finland has started introducing this into their school curriculum, learning how to spot fake news, how to interrogate, how to inform, but also how to make yourself self open to disconfirming information and so yeah you've got to tackle the supply and tackle the demand uh, in tandem otherwise we're pretty screwed 
What an excellent note to break for lunch on. <laughs> well, thank you both for your presentation. Sorry, David, we had so many technical issues, but delighted you made it. Uh, thank you to everyone else. We will, um, I'm loath to shut the webinar down and reopen it just in case we have any technical gremlins. 